So let's look at Philippians. A great challenge from God's holy word here in this first chapter. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. Grace to you, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. What a great promise. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere, blameless unto the day of Christ having been filled, filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Bless him for his powerful word. In ministering for the last 33 years, I've uh, spoken a few thousand messages, Never counted how many. It used to be about 900 a year, but a lot of people challenging me to slow down. And so I tried to pace myself more, and I'm now way down and only sharing maybe 400 times a year. But it's still a lot of messages, and you often want to get something a little different, especially with all my tapes floating all over the place. Nothing like preaching to people, and they sit there, and, oh, yeah, we heard that already on tape. Doesn't he ever get anything new? Well, I'm still reading the New Testament over and over and over again, and I keep, get some, I keep getting something new. I'm also rereading the Old Testament right now, and some of the passages, it's as if I'd never read them. Alec Brackett is here, and he's probably going to get a copy of this tape and make a few hundred. And I thought, well, maybe I should have a title, and I need a different title. And God, I believe, has given me the title for this little talk, this little exhortation from verse 9. Never used it before. What, think, what words do you think I'm going to choose for the title from verse 9? I pray your love may abound. That would be the best. But I think we've got a lot of tapes where the word love. I've written a book on that subject. No, the words that are on my mind more and more. Have you ever heard a message on that? More and more. As I was wrestling with what to share, it just came to me that you're a committed people, you have committed leaders, committed pastor, you have uh, a lot of teaching, you've had great friend Ian Thomas here recently. Well, what can I encourage you to do? What What can I challenge you to do? And it just came that there's probably not much of a need to give you anything new, but simply tell you to do more of what you're already doing. Now, doesn't that sound real dull? Because we like a new thing, don't we? And, you know, sometimes when a pastor gets intimidated and some ministers get easily intimidated... And, and they start looking for new messages, especially after they've been preaching a long time. Some of the stuff they come up with is really lousy. I know, I've listened to some of the tapes. I don't think Roy Hessian and some of his new messages, I'm not saying they're lousy, but I don't think his new messages match what he put in that book. 
and I've been following Roy for a long time. That is old, but it's new to many people. More and more, here was a church that was known for its love. Known for its love. But the Apostle Paul writes to them, and he says, more. He says, I'm praying. I'm not praying for some spectacular thing to take place. I am praying that your love, which you already know and you already have, may abound more and more. These people were known for their love. Your church is known for your love. But God would say more. More. There's several words that are on my mind tonight. And preceding each one of these words, which God really has burned into my heart again and again, I want you to put the, the word more. Or more and more. Because I think these particular biblical concepts, these attributes of revolutionary living, are already a reality, I hope, to most of you. But I think God has brought us together to say to us, maybe to us as a team, more. The first word is the one we just touched on. Love. It may sound boring. It may sound rep repetitive. But I believe more love is the greatest need among God's people. Our own fellowship has been known as a revolution of love. We've preached messages on love. We've distributed tapes on love. We have demonstrated God's love and our love to one another. Some of us have been together in this work 25, 20 years. We're going to have a reunion over in Holland next week. Not this week, but the one after that. 700 are coming together from all over the world. Because relationship is important. Because friendship is important. Imagine, OMers getting together without an evangelistic campaign. What's happening? Well, we just had that conference. That was last week. I've just come from there yesterday morning. 700. 700 gathered in Belgium. There were 400 in June. There'll be another six, 700. And just to keep in balance what I already said about the lack of missionary emphasis, the country that's still sending more young people on OM is Great Britain. Over 400 young people from Britain this summer, apart from 300 full-time or longer-term staff, have come on OM and are moving out on teams right now. But with all that said, I would say that the greatest need in OM is more love. More love. I had a phone call this afternoon. Finally, after all these years, I finally have this phone I can carry with me. So while I'm on the motorway coming uh, up here, I can be talking on the phone. And I talked to Peter Maiden, who is sort of like a co-director of OM. He is over in the States meeting with the North American USA Board of Directors. And uh, he shared with me that they just had a great meeting dealing with a number of difficult issues. And from that meeting came greater love among those who were involved. As we meet together to consider and make a final decision about getting or, or sort of ratify and, and take another step toward getting a replacement ship, as we gather the end of August for that meeting, our greatest need is more love. Do you want to know how to pray a little better for OM? Then understand this. We are an international body, an interdenominational body, from all different churches, and quite a few strong-minded people. Used to be a lot of strong-minded men. Now the strong-minded women are catching up, which makes it all very, very interesting. And we need prayer that we may have more love. More love. What church can say we have enough love? What pastor would be foolish enough to stand up and say, we have enough love in our congregation? 
We all need more love. And our love for one another is going to be tested. You may feel you love your pastor. You love your deacons or your elders. But I can tell you, that love's going to be tested. Because we're all human. We're all people. We all fail. And when everything is going well, and uh, the relationship is smooth, and there's no particular problem, and there's nothing we that disagree much about, then love is, love is easy. But it's when we fail one another. It's when things go wrong. And when things go wrong, that doesn't mean that God isn't blessing. We have some people who think because the ship hit the rocks, God sort of took off his blessing from the ship for a night and uh, let it hit the rocks. No, when God is working, the devil is working. When God is working, there are complications. Plus, God's great working does not eliminate the human factors of life. For the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. There's a lot of extremism today. The United States right now is suffering in a very, very big way. You may not think people there can suffer. They have so much money. But that country is being hit by the greatest drought in 20 years. Farmers, tens of thousands of farmers are in an awesome state. Some, if it repeats what's happened a few years ago, will commit suicide. Sometimes we're a little hesitant to pray for the rich countries. We pray for India. We pray for uh, Kampuchea. We ought to pray for the United States right now. Imagine some of those farmers that may be Christians caught up in one of the latest doctrines in America, the prosperity teaching, which says God always blesses, God always gives whatever uh, you need for, the, for, for what's best, whether it's a new car or, or more rain or, or whatever. Imagine if a farmer's got that teaching and he's just seen his, his farm completely destroyed and wiped out. Some people in Houston, Texas, when the oil thing went flat and were in that kind of teaching, became bitter, angry against God, disillusioned against Christianity. Doesn't work. That's right. One of the things I'm trying to learn as God's servant is not to promise people that which God doesn't promise. Because in the long run, it becomes a hurtful experience. Whenever there's a meeting and someone's mentioned having terminal cancer, there's always someone that gets really uptight about that and says, we must, no matter what, we must heal this person. And there have been thousands of people in Britain that have gone around the bend crying out for terminally ill people who God in His providence had decided to take and be with Himself. And that is His privilege. Whether the person is a few weeks old and my dear brother Alec and Sheila just lost a grandchild in a cop death, or whether it's a teenager or someone in their 20s or someone in their 70s. We need a bigger picture of life. We need, as God's people, to be a little less naive. We need to understand the difference between faith and presumption. And there are whole books on the subject now. Yes, God can heal, but often He chooses not to heal. Because he allows his people to live in a fallen planet where all this is part of the ingredient. My heart today goes out to those people whose loved ones were just killed on that oil rig. Why don't we just close all those things down? We knew from the beginning it was a risk. We want our cars. We want our petrol. We want our houses to be warm. Life is a little bit complicated. There are risks. Things do go wrong. Those people in Brownsville last week rushed into the supermarket to get out of the rain. That's a logical thing to do, right? But the roof caved in, and they're still digging out the bodies as of this morning. I know Brownsville because we had a Christmas campaign there many years ago to reach people for Christ. More love is the greatest need in our complicated world. Together with that love will come greater maturity. Together with that love will come greater patience. 
how easily we get impatient with one another. This becomes an epidemic sometimes in Operation Mobilization. All of our strong-minded people, everybody thinks to some degree they know how to do this better or that better, and we have collisions and impatience and irritability is manifest. I want to share with you, not easy to say so, that my greatest sins have been the sins of impatience. I have hurt my wife. I have hurt my children. I have hurt my best friends through irritability and impatience. I thank God at those moments, most of the time, their love was intact when my tongue was untacked. I don't know if you can say that, but you got the point. Any of you feel you have a little need in that area? How are you doing around the house? That's the big test of spirituality. It's not in the pulpit. A goat could be spiritual in a pulpit. It's in the house. It's in the house where the real spirituality gets tested. And I must confess, sometimes I've come up a bit short. So if you pray for George Verwer, who now is becoming a little bit known somehow, after 25 years of trying to hide behind the cactus plant, pray, Lord, give him more love. Lord, break him. Make him a better husband and a better father. Teach him more patience. And then when I feel the impact and I'm tested, I'll say, well, praise the Lord. There they are up in Manchester praying for me again. More love. That's, I believe, a word from God for us tonight. The second word that's on my mind is the word vision. I must be honest, if I didn't have a vision, I wouldn't be able to press on with the love. I'm just, I just wouldn't be able to. I'm, just, I'm a natural backslider. If I don't get something from God every day, I begin, to, I begin to leak. I begin to get a wrong attitude. Any of you ever have a wrong attitude? We can have a nice little gospel smile, smile like a piece of evangelical plastic, but inside we can be like a rattlesnake. I was climbing a mountain in Scotland, one of my favorite things. I don't get to do it very much listening to a cassette tape by John Stott. And the tape was on the subject of vision. He was speaking about leadership. And he pointed out that to be a leader, you must have a vision. He used the example of Wilberforce. That hit home to me because often I take people for a walk to the famous tree near my home by uh, Keston Vale where Wilberforce first talked to William Penn about his desire to present the idea of the freeing of the slaves and stopping slave trade. So as John Stott began to talk about Wilberforce, I tuned in. And he spoke about the vision this man had to, for the impossible and how he gave his whole life, he gave basically his whole life for that one vision. I want to ask you, do you have a vision? Do you have a vision of, of what God wants to do with you through your prayers, through your giving? Do you know why people are not generous givers to world missions? They don't have a vision. They don't realize what that even that five-pound note can do. I had that vision before I was even converted. That's right. I was reading the Gospel. A lady prayed for me, sent me a Gospel of John, I was reading this gospel in the process of coming to know the Lord and I got this vision for giving everybody in the world the gospel through the ministry of the Pocket Testament League. So I wrote in for their films and I showed their films in my, my very sleepy liberal ecumenical church and took offerings to give for the distribution of scriptures. I wasn't even saved yet. How people can want to spend so much money on themselves when they can put their money into scriptures, they can put their money into gospels, they can reach unreached people, they can feed the poor, they can put roofs over people's heads. Most people live in homes around the world smaller than the average British garage. It's, it's difficult for me to comprehend. It, my understanding would be that we, because people have such a vision and they want to give so much that pastors would have to be ministering a lot on balance. I've had to do it and encourage people that they've got to spend some money to them, for themselves. I have a message on this. I had to give it in OM years ago when um, 
we, we got a bit extreme and we never wanted to spend anything much on ourselves and it brought disunity and confusion and I, I even produced a memo about simple lifestyle and world missions and I had to learn some of this myself and realized that if we're a poor testimony, if we come, become some kind of religious weirdos and our, the roof is falling in our house and the garden looks a mess because we won't spend any money on, you know, on anything but the gospel, that is surely not God's way. We can't take one verse, we've got to take all the verses. But do you, do you think that's the big need in Britain today, given that kind of message? People are just, they're giving too much to world missions and there's too much sacrifice. They're neglecting their gardens. They're neglecting their cars. They're neglecting their homes. They're not eating enough. If this is a big problem in your community, please write to me. I need some illustrations to bring some of my other illustrations into balance. The fact of the matter is, not many people have the kind of hilarious, joyful, visionary giving that the Bible talks about. In fact, I believe we could prove that a lot of God's people are downright stingy. And this is why a lot of British young people, and I can prove this, many British young people have wanted to go to the mission field. It has not been possible. And you know what bothers me, and I don't think it would happen in your church, but what bothers me is people won't talk straight. Some elder in some little tiny church, he won't say, look, we don't feel that we should put our money into this young person. In fact, we don't like him. We don't think he's qualified. Instead of saying that, he's not qualified, we're not going to support him, they give you some other little song and dance. Do you, do you know that expression? And I believe this is very grievous. And when I go to a church and I have no money for missions, and yet there's, you know, there's a Jaguar, there's a Volvo, and I'm not saying you can never have a Volvo, because you can get old ones and they're usually cheap. They got all these new cars. But nobody for world missions. I say something's wrong. Otherwise my Bible's wrong. We need a vision of what we can do with our resources. A little group down near London got a vision for selling antiques. Can you imagine anything as insane in that as that in the British Isles? This is a nation of phenomenal sentimentality. People guard things given to them by the grandfather, got it from the great grandfather. And, and, and the, you know, this is important. This is, this is meaningful. The only time they'll part with it, they might sell it for big bucks to the Americans. And this little group down in London got the idea of selling antiques for world missions. Where were they going to get the antiques? They were believing that people were going to donate them. It's like, <laughs> it's like taking a tooth out of a galloping dinosaur, donating antiques. <laughs> Guess what happened? The Holy Spirit moved. And people all over Britain started to give their antiques. And you know how much they've given to world missions? That little group? Two million pounds. I use that British testimony all over the world, I'll tell you. It really increases the, the British testimony in America and in India and other parts of the world. And they think the British have got a vision. They don't realize it's only a few people that ever do anything like that. Let me tell you, I've taken surveys in America that prove that most Americans have never sold anything in their life to give to world missions. Can you believe that? The richest nation in the world with the greatest number of born-again spirit-filled people in all planet Earth. Something's gone wrong, don't you think? Or maybe I'm just, I'm off on a tangent. For 33 years, I've been asking people, look, if I'm on a tangent, correct me. We've got quite a few theologians in OM. No one's corrected me yet. OM has a lot of friends with other Christian leaders. No one's written to me and said, hey, you're off. No, contrary. They said, you're right. We need a vision. What we can do with our resources. We need a vision what we can do with our lives. I'm praying that out of Mission 2000, many young people will give their lives to world missions. And you know, if you belong to a church like this, you are at a terrific advantage. Because this church believes in world missions. They don't have to bring in George Brewer to say, now we will have the biblical basis for world missions. You've already had teaching on that. From your missionary-minded pastor and from others. And one of the reasons you've gone ahead with this great new church is because you believe you're laying a foundation here for something big. 
I don't think he put up this building in order to go backward. This is our vision for 1990s. John Dyer will now speak on going backward. No, I don't think this is the general plan here. But you know, you can be part of a live church, a visionary church, a missionary church, and you yourself be dead. I'm just studying the book of Revelation. It says that you have a name, you have a name, that you're alive, but in fact, you're dead. Young person, do you have a vision? Would you consider, and not necessarily young people, giving two years of your life to short-term missions? Now, why do I start there? Why don't I start and challenge all to become career missionaries and go to theological cemetery, a seminary and then do the whole thing? Because I believe in the light of what nationals are doing, in the light of the economics, in the light of the world situation, in the light of about five other factors that I haven't got time for, short-term missions, giving two years, is incredibly strategic. One false cult has 24,000 on the field right now. In Britain alone, they have 100,000 converts. Guess what group that is? That's not superficial because they turn the work over to the nationals when they go home. And because another 24,000 take their place. We need several thousand in Europe who will give two years. We've got specific jobs for two-year people. If they stay on longer, praise the Lord. It won't be possible for all of them. Then he will get married. That becomes more complicated. Little Junior will come along. His sister will soon come along. Um, and then it is more complicated. I wonder if you, you thought... How many of you young people, be honest now, under 30, how many of you have at least seriously considered giving one or two years to missionary service? You've already prayed that through a little bit. Just a little bit. Raise your hand. Come on, encourage my heart. Praise the Lord. Wonderful four people. That's good. So you already have a vision. It's four of you. So the word, the key word is, what? Well, more. I'm not asking too much to ask every one of you to pray about giving God two years. I stand as, as, the, as a person giving the Macedonian call. People are needed, not just preachers and teachers and theologians and church planters. In our work, we're desperate for accountants. We're screaming out for a bookkeeper. If you're a bookkeeper, you know how to keep financing books. You can almost, you know, we can almost have you aboard in two weeks. And normally it takes a couple of months. You know, we're, we're fast, but not that fast. We need motor mechanics. We have 400 vehicles around the world. About 100 of the 400 break down probably every month. Engines clap out. Tires sometimes uh, get punctured and all kinds of things happen. I wonder if anybody here knows how to repair an automobile. Anybody, I know this is going out among evangelical Christians. There it is. Well, one person knows how to repair an automobile. Oh, a couple of hands go up. You see, we've got a lot of cockeyed ideas about missions. We don't realize ordinary people are needed. We're lacking people who can put Christian books in boxes because in Africa they're crying for books and in India for crying for books. But we don't have these expensive robots yet in OM who can put the books in the boxes. Maybe some of you are into uh, robot technology and you can help us out. But meanwhile, we need some people with arms that can put the books in the boxes. We can't find enough single men for our ship. We may be held up on the second ship for the lack of single men in the deck department and in the engine room, which is hot, tough, hard work. And hot, tough, hard work is not too appealing to this generation. I am praying God's going to give you a vision. And I'm going to hear from some of you in a week or two, maybe through the past. And you're going to say, look, ever since that message, I'm not sleeping well. I'm getting these technicolor dreams. I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing India. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing old cars broken down along the road. I'm, I'm seeing uh, money piled up on desks that no one will count. I'm seeing all kinds of paper that needs to be sorted out and books that needs to go into boxes. And, and you're going to have a vision. And you know what Oswald J. Smith said? If you can't go, send someone else. 
Matthew chapter 9. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest, then he'll send forth laborers into the harvest. You might say, well, I can't go and fix a car, but your mind starts to go, you know a mechanic. He lives over there in Hull. Wow, he doesn't even have a job. You get him on the phone tonight. If necessary, send me the phone bill. And say, hey, we had a wild man in our church tonight and he got me upset or, or, or whatever. And I wonder if you would pray about becoming a mechanic for Operation Mobilization. I was speaking in a church in New York, uh, in New Jersey, where I was born about the ship years before we ever had a ship when most people thought it was a crazy harebrained scheme. And a man was in the meeting and he picked up a leaflet, why get an ocean going ship? He had a vision. Not much of a vision, very small vision. His vision was to send the leaflet to someone else. He sent it to a man in Australia who gave it to a man who was a chief engineer. We were crying out for a chief engineer. That man, unknown, didn't even know anything about O.M. Hardy, phoned me from Australia before we had the ship and he said, are you looking for a chief engineer? I said, what? I'm available. A Scotsman stuck in Australia. He joined us with his large family when we had no ship and worked on the tugs on the Clyde until we got the ship. And then he gave the best remaining years of his life to bring Lagos into being. Went back to Australia and died of a terminal illness. You may only have a few years left. Let's face it. What are you going to do with them? Are you going to sit? Are you going to rot like a lot of God supposedly chosen, generally frozen people? Or are you going to decide you're going to do something if you have to shake Manchester in the process of doing it? You're going to do something if you even upset your neighbor. Bless all of your neighbor's hearts. You're not going to be one more pew sitter. You're going to be a spiritual revolutionary. You're going to be a visionary. You're going to start reaching people. You're going to start praying. You're going to start giving. You're going to start recruiting others. You're going to start enrolling and getting more prayer letters. You're going to start buying and distributing Christian books. You're going to sell whatever you can get your hands on that you don't really need. And people are going to get, well, they're going to be amazed. They're liable to think you're filled with the Spirit. I know in some churches, it wouldn't be true here, but some churches who come along with a real heavy message on the Holy Spirit. People get you're really nervous, you get real tense faces. And I know none of us want to get into extreme things in the name of the Spirit. But isn't there a danger today in reacting to some of the extremism? We end up in the deep freeze of dead orthodoxy in which we don't know the freedom and the power and the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our life. Billy Graham often talks about the Holy Spirit. He's my spiritual father. I'm glad he talks about the Holy Spirit. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And in speaking about the Spirit-filled life, you know what he said? He said, I don't care how you get it. Just get it. I want to ask you, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Maybe that's the reason there isn't so much vision. Maybe that's the reason there isn't so much love. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, fullness, faithfulness, meekness. Against such, there is no law. Not that being filled with the Spirit makes it all automatic. Because the moment you're filled with the Spirit, you can still grieve the Spirit. You can still disobey. And I am always a little hesitant when I speak about some of these things because some people think then basically there's nothing they can do. And if they pray a prayer and nothing big happens, well, <laughs> leave it. There comes a time when you stop praying and you start obeying. And we need to often take the initiative. I feel one of the things we often need more of is sanctified imagination. Some of my leaders are praying that I would have less imagination. Lord, curb him. Control him. He's, he's going wild. He's got too many ideas. Somebody thought I was going to launch a submarine for evangelism in depth. Someone else wrote me, thought I was going to launch a gospel train, go up and down Britain with a gospel train. And then a character met me, was going to launch a jumbo jet for Jesus. Now, admittedly, I have too many ideas, and I have learned to put a lot of them in the file cabinet. But is that your problem? Tell me, do you get too many ideas? Too many ideas about how to win people to Christ, how to get more literature out, how to get more money for world missions, how to live on less? That's exciting. 
how to make use of used clothing. Do you know OM has saved over 100,000 pounds by avoiding buying so much clothing? We, we're free. We occasionally buy new things. My wife just bought me a nice new pair of trousers for my birthday. But think of the money you can save by going down to those places where they sell the, the second-hand clothing. Some of it is actually new. Some of it is actually new. And shoes. We can have the, we can have the Sinai experience. Remember the shoes didn't wear out? You can do the same thing. Well, it's a little different. Second-hand shoes. Oh, my. That's bad for the feet. You want to know when I wore all new shoes as a young boy before I was saved? I had perpetual feet problems. I had to go to a foot specialist. I had special shoes. When I got converted and started wearing all kinds of weird shoes, and some of them didn't even fit, I never had any problems with my feet. Hallelujah. Now you know I'm a healing nutcase. I'm not saying your vision has to be my vision or my vision has to be your vision. No, we're all different. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, God doesn't destroy our temperament. God's not going to make you... Some of you look very tense tonight. God's not going to make you into some loud mouth. Yankee? When I first came here, I thought I had to be British. I put on a black suit and a black tie. And I tried to speak in a proper English way and get everything on schedule and put my suitcase in the boot. But I discovered it was, it was phony. It wasn't even my temperament. Most Americans are not like me. Most of the Americans who join OM, many of them nowadays, are very shy. In fact, we had a British fellow write a protest letter recently to the Americans. I saw it. He said, I protest... Where are the old-fashioned, loudmouth, aggressive, gum-chewing Americans? We used to get these in OM, and they were a great help. Now we're getting all these post-Vietnam, quiet, shy, inhibited Americans. Huh. You can't win, can you? And let me tell you, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will still be you. And some of you are very, very English, and you will always be very English very English but oh my when a very very English person gets very very in love with Jesus and gets a big 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 vision and begins to move the world will feel the impact just read about Hudson Taylor and a few thousand other great missionaries from Britain and you'll see what I'm talking about more love more vision and lastly the word that burns on my heart is discipline Ooh, that's an unpleasant word, isn't it? Discipline. Because this is the missing ingredient in much of contemporary evangelical faith. Discipline. It's not a matter of making a recommitment of your life tonight. Sometimes I call people to recommitment, and I've done this in the past ten days, and I've got over 500 names and addresses of people to pray for. I don't think I'm going to do it tonight. But I tell you, any recommitment you make, any crisis experience you have that's not followed up by daily discipline, it will not work. Too many people are giving the idea that you just get the right ingredient, the right blessing, go to the right conference, and after that, basically, it will be automatic. One thousand times, no. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones I believe, put the nail in that coffin of false thinking in his book, Spiritual Depression, It's Cause and Cure. You can get a copy from your bookstore. A brilliant book. He emphasizes that we have to put on the whole armor of God. We have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I buffet, I buffet my body. Bring it into subjection, lest after preaching to others, I become a reprobate. You know, a lot of Christian leaders have been knocked out by immorality. It's rather intimidating to, to the rest of us, you know. But I'll tell you, for every one that's knocked out, there's ten that don't get knocked out. And if you interview the ten, you'll discover that one of the reasons, in every case, they learn something about biblical discipline. So when that subtle temptation came, it wasn't a matter of just calling on the Lord. These people who have fallen have often said, I called on the Lord to help me and nothing happened. I fell. Well, that makes God really look good. No. You see, that's 
false thinking. As you call upon the Lord, and I do plenty, you buffet that old body. You say no to that desire. Whatever it may be, whatever it may be, there are many forms of immorality. And that takes discipline. Why do we invite young people when they first come on OM to spend a summer or one or two years in an intensive training program where they learn about disciplined prayer, where they learn about living together with others, where we can teach them these things, where we can throw them out into tough situations and let them be stretched? And I can tell you OM is no total answer because they must learn something of discipline. The average person finds it difficult even to get up on time out of bed in the morning. That's the height of the spiritual warfare that they have been trained into. Many young people have never worked hard in their entire life. And then suddenly they're on the doulos. Maybe they thought it was an adventure cruise. And for most on the doulos, there's eight hours of physical work. Then the ministry, the Bible study, the prayer, <laughs> and all the rest. And I tell you, some people start screaming inside within the first few weeks. More discipline. I'm sure most of you are disciplined. You wouldn't be here tonight if you weren't a little bit disciplined. And so my message is simply more discipline. Now, there are many other things I'd love to talk about. So I leave you with those three words. More love. More vision. More discipline. And I'll tell you, when you move, in those three realms, in faith, in action, being filled again and again by God's Holy Spirit, you will become a world shaker. You will become a spiritual revolutionary. That is all there is of this recording.